a lot of what's going to happen in the next two to three years in terms of technology is existing already. It's existing on satellites and it's existing on aircraft. And ex what's happening now are two things, miniaturization and development of applications, the information technology piece of it. One of the things that's required is that in order to achieve the success is we've got to get out of our stovepipe mode and we've got to start working together. And I have the privilege of actually having been hired. I got out of Texas, it looks like, just in time. I was on the faculty down there for 25 years. Um, but I have the privilege of being on the faculty in engineering and in agriculture. And it's a great opportunity to actually work with people on both sides of the fence and actually accomplish something. I guess I was destined to work in this field because I grew up, so everybody know where Ridge Farm, Illinois is, south of Danville? Little tiny place. Uh, it's a good place to get out of and I walked a lot of soybeans. So I, I knew there had to be something better and I went into engineering. So I'll talk to you as I said about UAVs. So let's see here. Okay. UAVs are never going to be the answer, just like satellites are not the answer, just like GIS is not the answer. It's all got to be used together. And my colleagues and I like to, to use this schematic to talk about that. What we have here, so we've got the laser work, yeah, all right, up here we've got our remote sensing inputs. It could come from satellites, you know, space-borne instruments are good if you want great coverage, you know, a great extent. Aircraft, if you want to have higher resolution, all those spacecraft are doing better now. Drones, you have control. This morning we were sitting on the runway and we needed to take off and I was looking to the west and I said, oh my goodness, those clouds are starting to pop up after all this rain. And I had to wait for the pilot. If we had had our UAV that this morning out, we could have flown it. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing there. Anyway, so what we have are the remote sensing inputs from various sorts. Then we have our in situ measurements, and that's up here on the, on the upper left-hand corner. We have, and that's advancing too. One of the things we're looking at with our big um, plant science move at, at Purdue is a lot of new sensors that are going to be, as Karen Plout likes to say, down the road there's going to be a biological sensors we're going to plant just like we plant our corn, and they're going to degrade over the season. But anyway, um, Right now, you'll have various sorts of in situ sensors, and they're necessary. We can't get soil moisture of the surface from satellites very well. We can only get it a little bit in terms of a few centimeters. You need to have opportunities to actually get the soil profile, and in situ sensors are going to help with that. All that's going to be pulled together with models. And then we have the output here. We're going to take our output, we're going to provide products. Okay, so our goal is to integrate all of these ultimately in terms of agriculture. So, well, come on. There we go. So the piece that UAS plays in this is filling the gap. So we have our, and again, it's not the best of light, so you'll have your people on the ground doing some sort of um, observation. You'll have your aircraft uh, up here, your spacecraft even higher, and in the middle is going to be the UAS or UAV technology. So it's already been uh, covered, so I'm going to go through the pieces of this that I think overlap previous talks pretty quickly. The real justification for UAS is that it's expensive to have aircraft. Most of us don't own our own. Universities are fortunate many times to have their own and be able to fly more cheaply, but not unless you own the King Ranch, probably not you or me. Um, Space-based sensors are on fixed acquisitions, okay? They have orbits. We can't, unlike what they say in the movies, we can't move them around rapidly. And they are impacted by cloud cover unless they're long wavelength. Microwave, you can see through the clouds. Okay. Um, the UAS are going to give us uh, on-demand information, uh, as, as they, we've already discussed. There are lots of players. There are lots of people who are building these instruments, lots of people who are building the aircraft, and there are lots of people who want to use them. We're just beginning to start working together and learn what's, when we start flying what the deficiencies are in each of these arenas, and we're getting better. So these are just some examples. We fly both. Uh, rotors and we fly fixed wing aircraft at Purdue in our program. So we, being an engineering school, just as Illinois, but Purdue has a, a long history in flight 
And so we've been building UAVs for about 15 years, and some of them for agriculture, actually. Some, one of them is being used commercially. And uh, it goes everything from the little guys and the ones that you might throw with your arm to um, UAVs that are actually uh, associated with NASA that are the Predator class, and they're used for storm tracking. This happens to be one of them that I fly. It was given to me by the Brazilians, and it has a little bit of a funny story. I work in hyperspectral data analysis, I confess. Um, and the cameras are reasonably large. The data acquisition systems are the big problem. And it's getting better very rapidly. But I needed a big aircraft. So I was working with these guys in terms of some algorithms, and they said, you know, we have this plane, it's got a 10-foot wingspan, we'll give it to you. And they shipped it up to me, and it could carry my, my camera. It launches off, I should have had a video, it launches off the back of my 1993 Honda. And, uh, and off we go, and it flies 120 kilometers an hour. So that's a lot of fun. But you can imagine that Jim Beatty, who's actually the director of ACRE, the Ag Research Farm at Purdue, sits in his backyard and looks at my, my enjoyment with not too much enjoyment because he's always afraid something's going to happen with that big aircraft. And so just as the instrumentation is being miniaturized, so are the aircraft. We hope in the next two years to be able to fly something that's on the order of maybe a meter wingspan because of the instrumentation uh, getting so much smaller. So I'd like to talk about, just as Bill did, where we are. He talk, did a very good job of talking about the visible. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the multispectral piece of it. You know, people talk about NDVI. They talk about other kinds of indes, indices. And I want to, just because I teach this stuff, I want to give you a little bit of a word of caution. Because I had a farmer come to me and say, I got NDVI over this target, and I know it's exactly the same as it was last week. It's not corn. It didn't change. It's a stationary target, and it's different. What's going on? So we had to walk through it. So this is my opportunity to tell you, too. But anyway, a lot of the history of this started, as we know, in the military. And a lot of the sensors that, and the technology is now being transferred to the civilian community. The other piece of this is the radio control aircraft community. Any of you uh, hobbyists? OK. When I had a problem, I didn't realize that, because I didn't come from the flight uh, point of view, I didn't realize that you know there's a gene out there for people. It's a special gene you're born with. But if it gets activated, you're addicted for life. Because these people are just, you know, they'll do anything for you. They'll work with you. They'll help you teach you to fly your instrument. They're just amazing. Uh, if you crash it, they'll help you put it back together. So um, this has been another part of the community in terms of the university community that's been uh, very helpful in terms of developing our ag program. But what's happened in terms of the, the development is an interest in these integrated systems. Um, we said they're uh, miniaturizing the sensors. As software, that's a huge one. You can get a picture, but what do you do with it? You want to overlay it with your soils map. You want to overlay it with some sort of model you've got that you're using for predicting yield. You want to have this system you can use as a decision support system. And farmers are not going to take anything less. I know they're not. So this is where we are working uh, in the engineering part of this, because we know how to handle data. We all talk about big data. Uh, we know how to process big data. We don't always know the application, but we can work with you and develop uh, capability that actually you can use. So in the last line, I think it's the most important things. Pretty pictures are important, but remote sensing is much more than a pretty picture. Google did a wonderful thing. You know, it introduced people to spatial technology. People had thought of maps in a totally different way than when they started seeing raster maps. People see maps that are actually digital images from satellites. Behind that is a lot of data. And scientists and applications people use that data. And agriculture will do just exactly the same thing with UAS data. OK, where are we? As we've got visual cameras with the visible part of the spectrum, uh, a picture. We have multispectral cameras. Usually, there are three or six bands. And as Bill said, what they want to do is they want to capture what's happening in the leaves. We also have, uh, most, these are frame cameras. 
So when you see a frame camera, what it's going to do is it's going to go through and it'll get a whole frame. And as the aircraft flies along track, it'll get another one, another one, another one. The newest technologies are not that, where they have more detectors. They're going to be line cameras. And it, nothing comes for free. Nothing comes for free. Uh, thermal cameras. Thermal cameras at this stage are good relatively. They give you a picture, but absolute values from thermal cameras are really, they really, you really don't trust them for the most part. Thermal cameras are very difficult to calibrate, and they need to be calibrated continuously during the flight with onboard calibration. And we don't have that for, um, for UAS at this point in time. So it's a support kind of a, um, of a technology. It shows us visibly, you know, we know when it, we have a drought, the leaves get hot. Uh, we can use it in lots of ways, but we have to keep that in mind. So what happens in terms of the, um, the applications? Most people are using them with a three-band, if it's a multispectral camera, you've already seen a number of the visible camera uh, applications. Multispectral, they'll either overlay it, it'll be a blue, green, red, so it'll look like what you see in a picture. Um, or it'll be a near infrared and two other bands because it'll bring out the vegetation. And I'll show you why in a minute. Um, band ratios, that NDVI is one, and you'll see a bunch of other things that end with I as well in most uh, UAV applications. And some people now are even, if they've got good enough control, and this is all about the geometry, you have to have really good geometry in order to be able to do anything with height with these cameras, and it's photogrammetrically derived. We still have a problem having good enough IMUs on, because they're very expensive on these aircraft. If you want to fly them and get a visible image, no problem, a cheap IMU. But if you want to fly it and get height, or, and you know, this is one of the things that was really amazing to um, one of the air, uh, manuf airplane manufacturers. They said, but an IMU that's going to do the job is going to be $15,000. They didn't realize that farmers already pay huge amounts of money for RTK Act uh, on, their, on their equipment. And they have base stations. There's a lot of opportunity to do much better in terms of geometry. Okay, so here's what this amazing NDVI thing is. So these, these uh, spectral ratios are ratios of bands, differences of bands, normalized sometimes by the sum, so that you get a fraction. And you interpret that fraction as you know, relative to zero to one. And this is what it is down here. So it's the reflectance in the near AR minus the reflectance in the red divided by the sum. There are a bunch of others, soil adjusted. So if you've got, if you live in West Texas, you don't have much green stuff, but you do want to map vegetation. And so there are um, models that are used that for indices that are used actually to, um, to do that. And this would be what an RGB image would look like. It's an aircraft image on the left. Oops, well, there it went. Here we go, all right. And then this is an NDVI on the right. And so you see where it's red, it's bright white. And so you'll get a grayscale image that'll be, you can color it anything, but you know, colored green will be darker green if it's higher values, et cetera. So here's why. If we look at this leaf, then what we see in this leaf architecture is you see the green light coming in here in this top layer of palisade cells, and it reflects off to some extent. Energy can do three things. It can reflect, it can be absorbed, or it can actually um, be transmitted on through. And so the green comes through, a bit of it's absorbed, and some is reflected. Near IR is longer wavelength. It will go further into the leaf, and it will be reflected. And then down from this, this uh, secondary level. And then there will be some energy down in those higher wavelengths, the blue and the red, that will actually be totally absorbed here. So we want, wherever you have more near IR reflected, you're going to have a higher value in the near IR band, and you're going to have a lower value in the red band. And we want to take advantage of that in NDVI. And so just to show you, if you had a bunch of different stuff, and you're out you know, trying to, say, do a map of your fields, then what you'll have is different, we call them signatures. And these signatures for dark soil, bright soil, so these are just different wavelengths. And um, so an evergreen forest will look quite different than, than soil signatures. And we use those. There are algorithms you can use to actually classify what the images are containing in terms of their spectral signatures. Those are available. There, there's actually open access software. Here's that red edge. 
what happens with the evergreen forest is you get it up in the red, very high, this absorption feature down here in the, uh, the red, so the near IR in the red. This can be useful, not just in a one of a, because if you're studying over time and you want to look at what's happening, then we see this is actually from a satellite. So you would see 2009, 10, 11, and 12. And if it were a little better, then what we would be able to see, these are composites, and so it's NDVI, and we're looking at them bi-monthly. So this one is 516, 61, 616. And as it greens up, you can see here in Northern Illinois, subsequent month uh, in that year and here. Now this is a cloud. Uh, it's been composited the best it can be. But what happened was this summer, um, the crops grew faster, okay? That was in this, this last year than in the previous years. And that was due to usually high temperatures. We can't tell why, but uh, you have to go back to what happened during that year. But this is a surrogate variable that shows you what's actually happening. And if you were to do this over time, you've got to have data that are going to be have fidelity. That's why you have to take your data, you have to convert that digital number to a radiance, and then that has to be converted to a reflectance to take into account the sun angle and the atmosphere. Software is available to do that, but I think that Bill was right. In the short term, people will probably have consortia or groups that will actually be flying for you that will do that for you and give you the product. So here's where we're going. Now, I agree, hyperspectral is one of the sensors of the future, and, and it is here now, but it's not going to be in ag the same way as it is for many other applications, and I'll show you why. Um, we're going to have thermal. Um, now, most of the sensors are down in the visible near IR. If you're looking at soils, then there's a lot of information that's out in the shortwave infrared, a little bit longer wavelength. Um, if you're mapping residue cover, crop tillage, then um, 2.2 is a really good uh, uh, part of the spectrum. And the problem with putting these on, on UAVs right now is the technology requires that these detectors be cooled. These things have to be really heavy. So the, de the, de the technology for the detectors has to advance before we can get this off of an aircraft and onto a, um, a, a um, UAV. LIDAR, I'm a little bit, you know, LIDAR's great and actually that's you know, one of the signature areas I've worked in for 15 years. But in order to get anything that's really, uh, that's got good accuracy, you have to have extremely good G I IMUs and you have to post-process your GPS data. You can get a picture, you know, people will fly over the Matterhorn and you'll see the shape of the Matterhorn and all that. But you know, it can be off 20 feet and you'll never know it in the height. So this is something that's coming um, but it's going to be expensive for a while. I already talked about the issues with thermal, and then there's one more that people are looking at, and that is synthetic aperture radar. I don't think it's going to be so useful here in the Midwest, but it's, it is very good relative to soil moisture. Um, it's very good relative to biomass, but it's a, a very, it's at this stage, pretty advanced technology. The only one I know that's flying is one uh, that NASA has, and actually there's one being built in Brazil and the UAV has a 20-foot wingspan. So there are a lot of things that are going to come from this. We're going to, for time series, we're going to have to go to reflectance, not just pictures of digital numbers. We're going to be able to map crop stress. Um, we're going to be able to do invasive species mapping. We can even, people are going to have to do GMO certification, and these advanced sensors can do that. At Purdue, we have, we're part of a SOYNAM project, and we're doing it for phenotyping. And so we need these advanced sensors. Water quality is another one. Uh, lakes, rivers, we're flying these UAVs over um, one of the local rivers. And uh, finally, we're gonna be integrating it into some other models. And these are just some examples. Um, this happens to be the camera that we're flying. It's by a company called Headwall, but there are others. Uh, and there are two new um, LiDAR instruments that are out, totally different looking. Uh, that are, are being used um, on some very large, well, they're on aircraft, but also being considered for UAVs. So when we go to hyperspectral, Bill said, hundreds of bands, but you don't need them all, and that's, that's the key. So if you have this spectrum, that's, this is the reflection from some target, what you get with multispectral data is this, the integrated response over this range, this range, this is just a cartoon, this range, this range, four bands. 
But if you, you, this isn't a very good approximation in here. And so if I went to a hyperspectral camera, I have very narrow bands, and so I essentially map that spectrum. We, our camera maps them at 1.7 nanometers, but 10 nanometers is really the gold standard where you get good, good values. You don't really need to be down in the, the research grade. And so, oh, here we do have, this is the car, and this is the UAV. And so that's, uh, so if we were to, this is just again a, a, a picture that shows if you have multispectral data, even the Landsat data, which is the, the, the standard that, uh, free data that people get at 30 meters, then you're going to cover these bands. But if you, you're not getting a lot in terms of the true spectrum that you would want if you had various types of crops or soils. And so that's what you get with hyperspectral. The bands come out looking like this, so they're stacked. Okay, in our case, there's um, about 700 of them. And, um, and so the signatures after you process the data look like this. But there's a cost, because as you look up here, you see that it's not much different from, let's say, whatever this spectral signet value is, and then the nanometers, a few nanometers over from it. So there's a lot of redundancy. And so there's some that are irrelevant. The gaps in here, though, are the water absorption features that we took out. So there's a lot that goes into processing this, and uh, this is where the um, UAV solution has to be different. If I'm out looking for minerals, I know exactly what signatures, what, what particular absorption features I want to look for associated with particular minerals. But if I, and if I'm looking for lignin, if I'm looking for nitrogen, if I'm, I know what they are. So a UAV solution has to be, to, to build one that's going to have the most relevant narrow bands. And it'll probably have about 20 bands. Okay, so just to show you how this will go, I'm say, all right, let's consider that we'll have LIDAR. Then what you're going to get out of LIDAR, you have to do some processing on it, and you'll um, extract some information, and you'll get the vertical information. That's what it gives you. Digital elevation model, building, vegetation height, and structure. And so then if you were to say, okay, multispectral cameras, what can they give me? Well, they have to also go through processing. And we'll get some stereo products out of them that'll give us some vertical information. And that'll go into terrain-related products and plant height. You will not get plant structure, though. This is the thing that uh, is, gonna be, is really good about LIDAR, is you get the vertical structure. But it's, it gives you some information from what I've seen from corn, but not really much for soybeans. Where I've used it and had the most uh, benefit has been in tropical forest, where you're looking at different uh, layers of the canopy and you want to know how much biomass. And that's, we're not going to see too much of that in the Midwest. Um, coming out of that is spectral indices. And uh, so with both the multispectral cameras and we'll show it over here, the hyperspectral cameras will get indices and we'll use those with regression models and you can use your Excel spreadsheet for that uh, to, um, to actually get something that's meaningful. And from that, we'll get plant biochemistry, pigments, moisture, cellulose, um, associated with, as I said, the chemistry, and then the plant physiology. Now, when we move to hyperspectral, it costs us a lot in terms of work, but look at what we get. These are the hyperspectral indices. So if we look here, you'll see, here's NDVI in red. And so anything in red can be obtained by a multispectral camera. All the rest of them are going to be associated with hyperspectral data. And so if you look over here, these are the, the wavelengths, you see an awful lot of this is still going to be sub 1,000 nanometers. And that's available now. That's not a difficult technology. And that's what we actually fly on our UAV. So there are challenges in the future. Um, all of our students are having a good time. You know students always have a good time. So uh, it's a true recreational sport. One of the farmers I know in Indiana is training his mom because it could only be recreation for mom to be out flying uh, the UAV. And, uh, but we, this is the foundation. And I urge everyone to consider the, uh, at least investigating the technology because it's going to allow to put the foundation in place when these advances are uh, available. Uh, and actually affordable. So um, research is needed. I, I know that University of Illinois is doing research. Iowa is doing research. 
Purdue is doing research. So drop in, see those of us in ag and biological engineering, those of us in agronomy at any of these places, and, and catch up and also give us your input. We really appreciate it. Thank you.